Thank you everyone for joining me today. I'm Dr. Mahin from Imaging Study. We're going to start our today's session about the neonatal brain ultrasound. I had a great opportunity to work in neonatal intensive care unit to do portable ultrasounds for last few months as a part of my postgraduate course. Today I'm going to share a few of my experience that I have gained from doing that job. I'm going to share 10 cases today with a short discussion of each. Hopefully that will be helpful for you. Well, the neonatal brain imaging is definitely an essential part of management of the patients who are admitted to the neonatal intensive care unit. When we talk about the brain imaging, the things that come in our mind are the CT or MR imaging. But it's very difficult when you talk about the neonatal cases. You can't mobilize the patient and portable CT or MR facilities are not available throughout the world. There are some risks also which we'll talk a little bit later. So there comes the benefit of ultrasound. It's an ideal modality for examining the brain in neonate. The acoustic window that we can get by the unossified fontanelles in newborn help us to scan the brain with ultrasound. You know, the ultrasound is a very good modality to evaluate the soft tissue and these fontanelles help us do that. Now the objective of my session is to get an idea about how and what common brain abnormalities we have detected in NICU during our practice. During our scan, we have found some problems, some questions and to solve those questions, there comes the scope of research in this imaging field, which we'll try to cover in this video also. The neonatal brain ultrasound is unfortunately not well available in centers even in developed countries. It should be routinely done for all premature neonates. Any sick neonate in whom the brain pathology is implicated should also be scanned. If any brain anomaly is suspected on antenatal scan, then the baby should be scanned after delivery. And lastly, if the neonate has no prenatal screening, then a brain ultrasound should be done. Now here's the common cases that we have encountered in our NICU practice and I'll go with them in this session. The most common case that we have found is the intracranial hemorrhage. Then it comes the periventricular leukomalacia, cerebral infarction, infection, and edema. And lastly, we'll talk about the hydrocephalus and holoprosencephaly. Now, before starting my session, I would love to give you an idea about what we are trying to see here in brain ultrasound. We have the sagittal coronal and axial planes to see the brain. And if you're a beginner in this field, don't get worried. You can see on the right image, it is a sagittal section of the brain. The image is collected from your favorite Nitter Human Anatomy book. All of us are familiar with that book. And the same image is shown on the left one as a gray and white ultrasound image. You see, this is the cavum septum pellucidum at the central part as an anechoic or black area. Super to it, you can see this is the corpus callosum. Then these are the frontoparietal lobes, occipital lobes, and this is the brain stream here. This bright hyperechoic focus is the choroid plexus within the third ventricle. This is the area of third ventricle. This is the fourth ventricle area. And this bright area is the cerebellar vermis. If you don't want to remember these things, just remember two things. The black area that I will show you is the ventricle. And the bright area within the ventricle is the choroid plexus. Here is the coronal section image that you have seen in your Nitter anatomy book and the same image on the left side and you can see these are the frontal horn of the lateral ventricles. In between them this is the cavum septum pellucidum. This is the third ventricle. This is the corpus callosum. At the lateral aspect of the ventricle these are the thalamoganglionic region about which I will talk a little more. Here is the axial section. This is quite same image as you see in the right one. If you are an obstetrician or you do obstetric ultrasound, this view is the same view you have seen in your bipartal diameter measurement. So this is the fox and these are the thalamic region. In my today's session, I won't show you so much images of axial section except one. So don't need to worry about this view. Now let's start with the intracranial hemorrhage. The germinal matrix hemorrhages, also known as periventricular intraventricular hemorrhages, are the commonest type of intracranial hemorrhage in neonates and are related to perinatal stress affecting the weak-walled, highly vascularized subependymal germinal matrix. 
This germinal matrix contains the neuron and glial cells which migrate into their position later. So this is a dense tissue containing area as well as dense vascular area. They have weak connective tissue walls. So these are very common site for hemorrhage. Especially if the neonate is premature of around 28 to 32 weeks, then there is 67% chance of getting hemorrhage here. And around 90% of these hemorrhages can be detected within 4 days. Whereas 40% of hemorrhages can be detected within first 5 hours. We have a classification system for intracranial hemorrhage containing 4 grades. The last one being the worst one. In grade 1, you will get hemorrhage at the germinal matrix or in caudothalamic groove or subependymal region. In grade 2, the hemorrhage will extend into the ventricle, but the ventricle size should be normal. In grade 3, there will be intraventricular hemorrhage with dilated ventricles. And in grade 4, there will be hemorrhage extending to the brain parenchyma. So the last two make architectural distortion ensuring a very bad prognosis. So let's jump into our today's first case. This is a 9 days old neonate with preterm delivery at 29th week with a low birth weight of 1.1 kg with respiratory distress syndrome. Here on sagittal section, you can see this area is the caudothalamic groove. You see, there is a bright hyperechogenic area at this caudothalamic groove. This echogenic focus is the hemorrhage at the germinal matrix, indicating it as a case of grade 1 intracranial hemorrhage. Let's see on coronal section, you can see this hyperechogenic focus at the left caudothalamic groove indicating it as a case of grade 1 intracranial hemorrhage. So here is the picture, you can see the echogenic focus at the left caudothalamic groove indicating the germinal matrix hemorrhage. Now let's jump into the case number 2. Here we are going to show you a 14 days old neonate with the history of birth asphyxia and hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Here is the parasagittal section you can see a tiny hyperechogenic focus at the caudothalamic groove. You see this is the lateral ventricle here and this bright echogenic area is the choroid plexus. Now the choroid plexus should be one in number but here we can see two hyperechogenic structures. So the first one is the choroid plexus and the posterior one is nothing but the intraventricular hemorrhage. So this is the echogenic blood at the dependent part of the lateral ventricle. Here is the coronal section. Here you can see a tiny echogenic focus at the left caudothalamic groove. The ventricular blood is not well visualized here. However, it should be located at this part. So here is the picture, you can see the hyperechogenic germinal matrix hemorrhage at the left caudothalamic groove which extends up to the left lateral ventricle here, indicating it as a case of grade 2 intracranial hemorrhage. Now we have done a CT in this patient and on CT you can see there is diffuse hypodensity within the brain parenchyma due to hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy but the hemorrhages are not seen well here. So here comes the superiority of the ultrasound in neonates where you can detect easily the grade 2 hemorrhage but it's very difficult to locate with CT scan which is more superior imaging modality to assess the brain hemorrhage in adult. Now let's jump into the case number 3. This is a 16 days old neonate with preterm delivery at 29 plus week with a low birth weight of 1.1 kg and respiratory distress syndrome. These are the choroid plexus in coronal section. If you check carefully, the ventricles are asymmetrical. The left lateral ventricle is slightly dilated. And if you look at the choroid plexus, they are also asymmetrical. Here on the left side, you can see the choroid plexus is thick and if you check carefully, there might be something attached to the choroid plexus. There is also an echogenic focus at the medial aspect of the left lateral ventricle, which might be a hemorrhagic focus. We have done a high frequency ultrasound here and you can see the left lateral ventricle is truly slightly dilated and there is an echogenic focus at the medial aspect of the frontal horn of left lateral ventricle indicating it as a focus of hemorrhage. 
So this is a case of grade 3 intracranial hemorrhage where you have seen subependymal hemorrhage with extension of hemorrhage into the asymmetrically dilated left lateral ventricle. So make sure if you see any thickening of the choroid plexus, especially at the posterior aspect, it should be counted as a hemorrhage until proven otherwise. Now let's jump into the case number 4. This is an 11 days old neonate with preterm delivery at 28 week with a low birth weight of 1 kg having respiratory distress syndrome. This was a case of twin pregnancy with intermittent death of one. So this is the second one and let's see what we have seen in brain ultrasound. This is the sagittal and coronal section of the brain where you can see the ventricles are dilated. You can see the ventricles are filled with ecogenic matter which are also present in the third ventricle. So up to this image, this is a grade 3 hemorrhage, but on the right one, you can see this ecogenic foci are also seen extending to the brain parenchyma, indicating it as a case of intracranial hemorrhage grade 4, where we have found the extension of the hematoma into the occipital lobe. Now fortunately, we have the opportunity to repeat a scan in this patient. And on 31th day before releasing the patient, we have scanned again and you see the ventricles are dilated here forming the hydrocephalus and there is an ecogenic focus at the occipital horn region which is nothing but the retractile clot. On coronal section, you also can see these dilated ventricles. But overall, the brain parenchyma doesn't contain any porencephalic cyst or any other complication other than some periventricular leukomalacia, which I will cover slightly later. So this baby had a very good in-hospital prognosis and while I'm making this video, the baby is still alive. So these are the four gradings of the intracranial hemorrhage. So you will get hemorrhage limited to germinal matrix in grade 1. It will extend to the normal size ventricles in grade 2. The ventricles will be dilated in grade 3. And if hemorrhage extends to the brain parenchyma, it will be counted as grade 4. Now, what will happen if these ecogenic blood clots get resolved? Here's a picture of a resolving hematoma. You see, this is the cordothalamic groove. And at this cordothalamic groove, you can see an anechoic cystic structure with a thick ecogenic wall. So it is slightly elongated, not like a choroid plexus cyst. So this elongated cystic space at the left cordothalamic groove is nothing but the resolving hematoma. Here's another case. You can see a multicepted elongated cystic area at the cordothalamic groove extending to the lateral ventricle here. This is the picture of the patient I have shown you as a grade 2 intracranial hemorrhage. And this is nothing but the resolving hematoma of the patient. Now let's talk a little about the prognosis. The grade 1 and grade 2 hemorrhage have good prognosis usually. But in case of grade 3 and grade 4, as you are causing some architectural distortion, the prognosis is usually not good. There should be some developmental retardation with abnormal neurological findings due to post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus as well as loss of brain tissue and formation of porencephalic cysts. Let me show you some cases that we have got in our department. This is a patient with a history of grade 4 intracranial hemorrhage and during our this scan we have seen some cystic space at the parietoccipital region indicating the porencephalic cyst formation. Here's again another picture of this patient. There is also cystic space in the parietal lobe, which is nothing but a type 3 periventricular leukomalacia. Another case, it apparently looked quite normal other than the dilated lateral ventricles. If you look carefully, the choroid plexus doesn't look quite normal here. And on the right image, you can see there is something irregular anechoic cystic area with internal ecogenic focus. So this is nothing but the asymmetrically dilated lateral ventricles with ecogenic internal clots and a porencephalic cyst with internal clot on the left side, indicating it as a sequelae of grade 4 intracranial hemorrhage. Let's jump into the case number 5. This is a 29 days old neonate with a history of preterm delivery parental asphyxia and hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. During our ultrasound scan, we have seen this is a coronal section and you can see 
diffuse cystic spaces occupying the frontoparietal lobes. The whole brain parenchyma has been changed to diffuse cystic areas. If you check the frontoparietal or deep white matter region, all are containing tiny cystic spaces. The normal architecture is completely lost here. So this diffuse cystic appearance involving the frontoparietal lobe as well as the deep white matter is nothing but the grade 4 periventricular leukomalacia. You see in coronal section, these are the frontal horns, which are asymmetrical also. And this is cystic spaces of different size are occupying almost all over the brain parenchyma. There are some echogenic areas also within the periventricular region. This is the choroid plexus here within the lateral ventricle. If I'm not wrong, I have already uploaded this case video on our YouTube channel. So don't forget to check the card for a detailed scan. So this is a case of periventricular leukomalacia grade 4, where you have seen areas of increased periventricular echogenicity with extensive cystic lesions in front of temporal occipital lobes extending into the deep white matter. So it definitely should have a very bad prognosis. So let's talk a little about the periventricular leukomalacia. It is also known as white matter injury of prematurity, which is more used term nowadays. It is very commonly seen in 32 to 36 week premature neonates where the cells of germinal matrix tries to migrate into the brain parenchyma causing increased need of vascular flow within that part but due to cellular vulnerability, impaired cerebrovascular autoregulation, periventricular arterial end zones with superimposed insult from chorioamnionitis or and with a pre or perinatal hypoxia watershed ischemic changes occur and it turns into the necrotic cystic spaces later. So we have four different grades of periventricular leukomalacia. The last one should be the worst one. Each of them has the increased periventricular echogenicity. In grade one, there is no cystic change. In grade two, you will get small periventricular cystic spaces. In grade three, there will be extensive periventricular cystic spaces in the occipital and frontoparietal regions. And in grade 4, the cystic lesions extend into the deep white matter. Here is the picture of a grade 1 periventricular leukomalacia, which is quite subjective and a little bit confusing for beginners. You see, the periventricular regions show slightly increased echogenicity. This increased periventricular echogenicity may be well understandable with high frequency ultrasound and in coronal section. So here's the coronal section, you can see some echogenic areas at the periventricular region indicating grade 1 periventricular leukomalacia. Here's the picture, you can see some echogenic areas at the periventricular region indicating the periventricular leukomalacia. Some authors say that these echogenic areas should be as bright as the choroid plexus. A confusion appears at this point is that when you get a premature neonat at around 32 to 36 week age, there is normal migration of cells from germinal matrix to the brain parenchyma. At the time, these areas of migration appear slightly echogenic. So it makes a confusion with the periventricular leukomalacia. The periventricular leukomalacia grade 1 should stay more than 7 days, but these normal physiological migrating cells with increased echogenicity should not stay more than 7 days. So it's very difficult to differentiate between these two within first 7 days of life. So a repeat scan after 7 days may help you confirm the periventricular leukomalacia. Here is a picture of grade 2 periventricular leukomalacia where we have found tiny cystic spaces at the periventricular region. These are the frontal horns and lateral to it you can see tiny cystic spaces indicating it as a case of periventricular leukomalacia grade 2. Here is a picture of the grade 3 periventricular leukomalacia 
you can see the ventricles are slightly prominent or dilated. If you check carefully, there are multiple tiny cystic spaces within the frontoparietal lobe. You can also see tiny cystic spaces superior to the corpus callosum. This is the corpus callosum and these are the cystic spaces. The overall barren parenchymal echogenicity is heterogeneous. You see the periventricular region shows increased echogenicity. Parasagittal regions are also echogenic. So this is a case of grade 3 periventricular leukomalacia with cystic spaces extending to the frontoparietal lobes with echogenic areas of ischemia. Now again the grade 4 periventricular leukomalacia which we have already covered in this session. Now let's jump into our today's case number 6. This is a 9 days old neonate with preterm delivery, low birth weight of 1 kg and perinatal asphyxia. During our ultrasound scan, we have seen the periventricular echogenicities are increased, indicating the periventricular leukomalacia grade 1. But if you check carefully, this is the part of deep white matter which is also echogenic. So we have checked on coronal section. This is the right lateral ventricle containing the choroid plexus. And lateral to it, if you check here, the periventricular echogenicity is increased. But here you can see a bright echogenic focal area extending to the deep white matter. So this is nothing but the cerebral infarction where we have found diffuse echogenic area of ischemia in the deep white matter of right frontoparietal lobe. The infarct and leukomalacia both are ischemic change. However, when it is localized and asymmetrical, we love to use the term cerebral infarction. So it is not only can be detected with CT or MR scan, we also can see it on ultrasound. This patient also had a companion, nothing but the germinal matrix hemorrhage at the left corothalamic groove. The usual observation in cases of ischemia is a combination of diffuse increase in echogenicity of the ganglionic areas with associated obliteration of the cisterns and the compression over the ventricles. If you have the Doppler facility, then the serial Doppler examination of the intracranial vessels and circle of Willis is helpful in evaluating the severity of intracranial ischemia. Both the increase in diastolic flow and decrease in diastolic flow of the middle cerebral artery may indicate poor changes of brain parenchyma. The area of ischemia will have a very poor blood supply. As a complication, within 3 to 6 weeks, there will be cystic degeneration. Ventriculomegaly associated with brain atrophy can also be seen as a sequelae of ischemia. Now let's jump into the case number 7. This is a 3 days old neonate with term delivery at 38 weeks. The birth weight was around 2.8 kg. There was meconium stain liquor with hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Here on parasitical section, you can see there are some echogenic linear areas at the thalamoganglionic region. These linear echogenic areas are seen along the thalamostrate vessels which supply this region. Here on coronal section, you still can see these echogenic linear areas extending to the cordothalamic region. So these linear echogenicities in the thalamus and basal ganglia along the thalamostrate vessels indicate it as a case of mineralizing vasculopathy. In mineralizing vasculopathy, you will get linear bright branching streaks or patches either unilaterally or bilaterally along the basal ganglia region due to the calcification of the walls of thalamostriatal and lenticulostriatal medium-sized perforating arteries. So in which cases you will get this calcification of the thalamostriatal and lenticulostriatal vessels. Mineralizing vasculopathy is a non-specific sign of torch infections, especially in toxoplasma and cytomegalovirus infections. In chromosomal disorders like Down syndrome or Patau syndrome, you may also see it in neonatal asphyxia, fetal alcohol syndrome or maternal drug abuse and it also can be seen in congenital HIV infection and high drops cases. Now the case number 8. This is a 17 days old neonate with term delivery at 39 plus week with 2.6 kg of birth weight. 
There was a history of meconium aspiration, perinatal asphyxia, and hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy with neonatal jaundice and also a candida positive blood culture. Here is a sagittal section of the brain and you can see the overall brain looks quite normal. But if you look at the corpus callosum, it looks slightly hypoechoic and thickened. That took our attention. So we did a coronal section here and you still can see the corpus callosum is slightly thickened and hypoechoic. The overall brain parenchymal ecogenicity is heterogeneous. There is a spot of hemorrhage at the cordothalamic groove indicating germinal matrix hemorrhage. So we have used the high frequency ultrasound and on sagittal section you can see there are thickened cerebral gyri causing effacement of sulci. You see there is no sulci present here and the corpus callosum looks thickened and hypoechoic. On coronal section you still can see this thickened hypoechoic corpus callosum along with thickened cerebral gyri. Overall periventricular echogenicity is increased but the brain parenchyma is heterogeneously hypoechoic. So this is nothing but a case of cerebral edema where you have seen diffuse swelling of the cerebral gyri with heterogeneous hypoechogenicity of the brain parenchyma with effacement of sulci and solen hypoechoic corpus callosum. We have also found a focus of germinal matrix hemorrhage at left cordothalamic groove. The cerebral edema is actually a difficult case to diagnose with neurosonography. The size of the ventricles varies considerably, so the ventricular size change is an unreliable parameter to assess the mass effect in this case. However, in our practice, we have seen that the edematous or solen corpus callosum may guide you to diagnose a case of cerebral edema. This finding may not be found in your textbook, but guide you to diagnose. Now the case number 9. This is a 10 days old neonate with preterm delivery at 29 plus week with a low birth weight of 1 kg and respiratory distress syndrome. During our ultrasound scan, this is the coronal section you can see, the ventricles are dilated. These are the lateral ventricles, this is the third ventricle, this is the fourth ventricle, all are dilated. The overall brain parenchyma is slightly thinned, indicating it as a case of hydrocephalus. Here is the axial section, the only axial section I have shown you today. You can see the third ventricle and lateral ventricles are dilated and on the occipital horn you can see an echogenic focus separated from the choroid plexus. This echogenic focus is nothing but a retractile clot indicating it to be a sequelae of grade 3 or grade 4 intracranial hemorrhage. Here's the picture you can see there is gross ventriculomegaly with intraventricular retractile clots and thin brain parenchyma indicating a case of hydrocephalus. To measure the ventricle we have different approaches. If you choose the anteriofontanelli approach you can measure the anteriohorn width at the foramen of Monroe which should be less than 3 mm. You can also measure the diameter of the lateral ventricle at the level of atrium and occipital horn which should be within 8.7 to 24.7 mm which is very difficult to remember. So we'll go with another measurement technique. You can also measure the third ventricle width which should be within 2.6 mm. These are quite difficult to remember so you can also choose this parameter. If you see on sagittal section the ventricle is more than 5 mm it should be counted as mild ventriculomegaly. If it is more than 10 mm should be counted as moderate and more than 15 mm should be counted as severe ventriculomegaly. So whatever you do, make sure what you see is more important than what you measure. So your eyeballing is much more important to make a diagnosis of ventriculomegaly or hydrocephalus. We also have the even index and other measurement technique to say that hydrocephalus, but I don't want to cover it here. It will make the station more clumsy. Now our today's last case, the case number 10. This is a one and a half months old male patient with a birth weight of 2.1 kg. It had too many congenital anomalies like cleft lip and cleft palate, microcephaly, hypotellurism, absence of nasal bone and hyponatremia. During our ultrasound scan, you can see these are the fused thalami and you can see a monoventricle anterior to it. There is no interhemispheric fissure here. You can see the fused thalami. 
and this is the monoventricle. So this is nothing but a case of holoprosencephaly. Here is the picture, you can see the monoventricle and fused thalami with absence of interhemispheric fissure. This patient had gone through a CT scan where you can see the space between two eyeballs is decreased indicating hypothalorism. And you can see a monoventricle with absence of interhemispheric fissure and fused thalami indicating it as a case of holoprosencephaly. In holoprosencephaly, there will be incomplete separation of the cerebral hemispheres. It is often associated with facial abnormalities and has a very poor rate of survival. Only 3% survive to delivery. As diagnostic key points, you can remember that there will be single ventricle absence or partial hemispheric or and basal cleavage with absent or incomplete interhemispheric fissure. There will be absence of cavum septum pellucidum which guides us commonly in case of lower and semi-lower variety. There will be single or agigous anterior artery on Doppler and associated facial defects are very common. In case of holoprosencephaly, remember that the face predicts the brain. Facial malformations of any kind should trigger very careful evaluation of the brain to exclude holoprosencephaly or any other brain defects. Now we have three different types of holoprosencephaly, allobar, semilobar and lobar one. The first one should be the worst one. In case of allobar variety, you will see the single monoventricle with no interhemispheric division with associated absence of olfactory tracts and corpus callosum and the facial abnormalities are very common here. If you find a case of holoprosencephaly and you see there is presence of cleft lip and cleft palate, hypothalorism and mid-face hypoplasia, then remember that this might be a case of trisomy 13 or Patau syndrome. Semilobar holoprosencephaly is the intermediate severity in holoprosencephaly spectrum due to partial cleavage of prosencephalon. You will get an absence of cavum septum pellucidum with anterior communication between the ventricles. There will be incomplete interhemispheric fissure with fused frontal lobes but separated occipital lobe. The thalami are completely or partially fused and the facial abnormalities are still present but milder than allobar one. The lower holoprosencephaly is the least severe form of holoprosencephaly where you will get presence of interhemispheric fissure, absent cavum septum pellucidum and a gyral continuity. According to the neuropathology, the definition specifies that one gyral continuity should be present across the midline to say it as a case of lower holoprosencephaly. So this is very difficult to say with ultrasound but can be diagnosed with MR scan. So these are all 10 cases we want to show you today. Now let's talk a little about the advantages of cranial ultrasound. It is cheap and safe. It can be performed bedside and can be performed immediately after birth and you can repeat it when necessary. It requires no sedation, it requires no radiation and it's a reliable tool when you want to detect hemorrhagic or ischemic brain lesions and it helps visualization of ongoing brain growth, maturation and changes of brain lesions over time. But we have some limitations of cranial ultrasound. It's an operator dependent technique, so well training is required to make a good diagnosis. As we are working with a machine, good quality machine with a variety of transducer is also required. Now we have a very small space through which we can transmit the sound to see the brain. That makes sometimes difficult to see the overall brain quite well. And this is the limitation that I feel much more in my practice is the less mobility. I had so many patients who are in ventilation and it's very difficult to move them. There are blood channels within the scalp and very difficult to see the brain through narrow windows. They need oxygen support and I couldn't move them also. Now another question comes in your mind is that why not we are doing CT or MRI in these cases? Well, CT has radiation hazards. For MRI, you may need sedation. These babies are already in a vulnerable state and if you give them a sedation, they may not return back. So it's quite difficult to do. Now these examinations are costly. When you are doing a bedside ultrasound, it is much, much more cheaper than these investigation tools. And these neonates are in ventilation, so it's very difficult to mobilize and you can't take out them from ventilation and put them into your CT or MR machine for 30 minutes. So these are very difficult process for neonates admitted to NICU. These are not procedures for repetition. We can do ultrasound every day but not the CT or MRI. 
So at the end of this session, we want to give you a take home message. The neonatal brain ultrasound can be an emerging field of imaging in our country, helping early detection and management of critical cases in neonatal intensive care unit and thus reducing the neonatal mortality and morbidity. It also gives you a scope of research in this field. Just before end of this session, I want to give you two points that may help you do your research if you are a resident or willing to do research on neonatal brain imaging. In our practice, we have seen that to detect cerebral edema, corpus callosal thickening is a very important finding. But if you search this point in your textbook, you may not find. I have shown you some cases of brain hemorrhage. When I check my previous reports, I have found that most of the germinal matrix hemorrhages that I have diagnosed are at left cordothalamic groove, not on the right one. So why the left cordothalamic groove is much more vulnerable to hemorrhage than the right one? These problems can be solved with your research, so if you are interested, can go with that. So that's all for today. Thank you for watching this video. If you find it helpful, don't forget to share it with your friends and don't forget to subscribe our YouTube channel for more videos. We wish you all the best. See you on the next one. Have a nice day.